Good evening, and welcome to the forum here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, we have a very interesting program tonight. Uh, it's called uh, Afghanistan, a campaign assessment, and I sometimes think that this is the war the public forgot. We pay so much attention to Iraq, and necessarily so, but let's remember it all began really after 9-11. Uh, with Afghanistan. So we have a tremendous opportunity tonight to learn about that situation, the other war, how it's going, what it means for us. And to begin our program, I want to introduce someone who's going to introduce our distinguished guest tonight. His name is Jimmy Garmandia. He's a Harvard student, uh, a sophomore uh, from Miami, Florida, studying government and economics here, and I'm proud to say an ROTC cadet. And when he graduates, and let's give him a big round of applause and thank him for being here this evening and also for being in ROTC. When he graduates, he's going to join the Army, as the uniform uh, uh, suggests, uh, the same branch as our distinguished guest tonight, whom Jimmy will now introduce. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you here tonight. These days, it's not very often you see a Harvard student walking around campus in uniform, much less a general. However, tonight we are fortunate to have with us a man who is both a general and a Harvard graduate. As a student at a civilian college training to become an officer, I have the job of balancing academics with military training. Tonight we have with us a man who is indeed provides the model of scholarly pursuit as well as military service. Hailing from Goldsboro, North Carolina, Lieutenant General Eikenberry attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduating with the class of 1973. During his impressive 34-year career in the Army, General Eikenberry has served in operational assignments as both commander and staff officer for mechanized, light, airborne, and ranger infantry units. Having served in almost every position from platoon commander to the assistant division commander of the 25th Infantry Division, General Eikenberry has experienced the full extent that the United States Army has to offer. With his various postgraduate degrees, General Eikenberry represents the highly educated officer corps of the United States Army. Holding a master's degree from Harvard in East Asian Studies, as well as a master's from Stanford in political science, General Eikenberry is also fluent in Mandarin Chinese. In addition, he has been published various times with articles on Chinese military history, Asia-Pacific security issues, and military tactics and training. With his background in East Asian studies and political science, General Eikenberry has served as the defense attache in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, as well as the senior country director for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Most recently, Lieutenant General Eikenberry has served as the commander of the Joint Forces in Afghanistan, where he served from March of 2005 until January of this year. Prior to taking this command, General Eikenberry was in charge of the Office of Military Cooperation in Afghanistan, where he oversaw the rebuilding of Afghanistan's physical, bureaucratic, and security infrastructure. This position illustrates the importance of leaders such as General Eikenberry, who can direct military operations as well as civilian efforts. With his scholarly background and military proficiency, it goes without saying that General Eikenberry is an invaluable resource to the United States Army. Being a Harvard graduate serving in the military, General Eikenberry represents the sometimes forgotten tradition Harvard has with the military. However, tonight, that tradition continues as we are fortunate to have with us a man who truly defines the scholarly soldier. It is therefore an honor and a privilege to introduce to you a fellow Harvard man who has represented this university, but most importantly, served our country to the fullest. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Eikenberry. Jimmy, uh, thank you very much. My, my mother obviously prepared those uh, remarks. Those, uh, those were very kind. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, start off by uh, thanking uh, ASU for uh, hosting this tonight. And it is indeed great to uh, be back at Harvard University. I had two opportunities as a master's degree candidate and then as a national security uh, fellow to live here in Cambridge and the honor of attending Harvard. I have to say there are two of the most formative assignments that I've had in my uh, military career. So it is indeed an honor to uh, be here. What I'd like to do is, uh, if I can step away from the podium for my remarks, and then uh, I guess I'll be sitting back down for the, uh, for the uh, discussion later on here with uh, Ash. But, uh, and you, you can still hear me. What I'd like to do is uh, just start off with a very brief uh, story. And the story is that there's two people who are in a hot air balloon. And they're drifting across the United States on a cross-country flight and they go above a cloud cover and they get completely disoriented and lost and they don't have a global positioning system with them. So the navigator of the balloon suggests they drop through the cloud cover and in order to get a fix on their location. They drop through the cloud cover and lo and behold below them is a huge building surrounded by an even larger parking lot. Somebody's walking towards their car in this parking lot. The navigator leans over and shouts the question, where are we? And the person going towards the uh, car looks up and says, you're in a hot air balloon. And so they go back up through the cloud cover. And immediately, the navigator turns to the pilot and says, I've got it. We're over the Pentagon, Washington, DC. And the pilot turns to the navigator and says, from that answer, how could you possibly know that? And the navigator says, think about the answer. It was concise, it was accurate, and it was of no help whatsoever. <laughs> So tonight, I'll try to be concise and accurate, but I will try to be of some help. What I'd like to do very briefly, uh, Ash has uh, graciously given me about 20 minutes for uh, some introductory remarks. What I'd like to do is talk very briefly about where do we stand in Afghanistan, I think much more important for this audience. I'd like to then transition and talk about four different major issue areas that we're going to have to hopefully affect uh, that we'll have to address effectively as a nation, with the international community, with the Afghans, that I think ultimately will define success or failure long term in Afghanistan. So if I could, I'd like to start with a little bit of uh, Geography 101 uh, with Afghanistan. And when I talk about the uh, Geography uh, 101, this is not to uh, insult anyone's intelligence here. But it is important to understand the geographic, the topographic challenges that we face that in every domain, whether it's the security domain, governance, the economy, really shape and constrain what we can do. Now, first of all, there's the map of uh, Afghanistan. If we look to the, uh, to the upper right-hand corner, there is uh, at the uh, Chinese border. And Jim, if you could uh, point to that up there. That's at the uh, Chinese border. And then if you go to the southwest, about 1,900 kilometers distance. That's the southwest border where the distance on the US map would be roughly from New York to New Orleans. Now, over that span, starting again at the northeast, at the northeast corner on the Chinese border, working your way through the southwest of Afghanistan, about 2 thirds of the way, is the Hindu Kush Mountains. The Hindu Kush Mountains, at most points along the Hindu Kush, it's about one and a half times the height or the altitude of Mount Whitney. And then when you reach the southwest point on the Hindu Kush, you immediately transition to the south to the Great Red Desert of Kandahar, or to the southeast to the deserts of Ghazni. Just to give you a sense, in the military domain, I could speak in any domain, in the military domain, what does this mean? I'll give you a vignette. 10th Mountain Division is currently in eastern Afghanistan at a location that's called Konar Province in Nuristan Province. They have forces today that are about 9,000 feet elevation in mountain outpost, waist deep snow. Those same forces, some of those same forces in the spring will relocate down into Kandahar Province where they'll be in the Great Red Desert. Temperatures during the daytime about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, one of the most formidable deserts in the entire world. And on top of that problem that we face with the tyranny of the topography and the climatology, the other problem that we face is there's not, of course, a robust physical infrastructure and economic infrastructure within that country. Afghanistan has always been a poor country. But then on top of that, 25 years of warfare took what infrastructure existed, very dilapidated. In 33, 34 years of military service, I have never been in a country which poses more formidable challenges in terms of geography and infrastructure. 
And then when we talk about the borders of Afghanistan, Afghanistan, a challenging neighborhood for those of us in the United States that have Canada to the north, Mexico to the south, the neighborhood by comparison that Afghanistan lives in is a dangerous neighborhood. All of the borders along Afghanistan that it shares with its neighbors where there's problems of cross-border terrorism, there's problems of cross-border narco-trafficking criminality, all of those borders extraordinarily difficult to control. So with that now, let me shift and give you a quick update on what I'd say is a snapshot in time. How are we doing inside of Afghanistan at this point? I'd like you to look at this slide, and then if you'd go to the lower left-hand corner, look at that picture there. That's a picture of a woman wearing a burqa, an Afghan woman, who's being executed at the soccer stadium in Kabul. That picture is from 2001 before the attack on the United States of America. She's being executed as halftime entertainment by a Taliban soldier. Her crime, alleged infidelity. That's the snapshot in time of 2001. Now, what we have then working up towards the upper right-hand corner of the objective that we're all seeking with the international community, the US, the Afghans, the establishment of a moderate, stable form of government in Afghanistan, a government of capable securing its own borders, providing a reasonable set of social services to its people, that represents a series of milestones that occurs over time as we work towards that goal, a series of political and international milestones. In the upper left-hand corner, it shows the attributes of Afghanistan in 2001. In the lower right-hand corner, the attributes of Afghanistan, some of them in 2007. But back to the picture in the lower left-hand corner. That's the baseline that we begin with in 2001. The picture, again, about one mile from where my headquarters was in Kabul, about one mile from where President Karzai's office is. What else would be part of the snapshot in time in early 2001? Obviously, you've got rule of gun. There is no rule of law. You have no formed Afghan national security forces. You have only militias and extremist Taliban forces. You have no democratically elected government. You have no extension of social services. 2007, some of the attributes that are shown there. What are those attributes? You now have removal of about 90% of the country in 2001, open safe haven for international terrorism. You have a democratically elected president who worries about his popularity ratings having fallen to 65%. You've got one of the most moderate, stable, you've got one of the most moderate progressive constitutions in Central Asia and South Asia. You have a democratically elected parliament that's doing a reasonably good job of connecting the people with the government. You have 700 medical clinics that have been established. They extend health care to about 8 million of 30 million Afghan citizens, albeit in some cases very rudimentary. You have 6 million children in school, 2 million are women. You have 19 universities of the 19 universities, 40,000 university students, 20% of those are women. I could go on. Those are some of the macro statistics. Now against that, what else is part of the snapshot of Afghanistan 2007? I'll talk about those in just a minute. You have extraordinary problems with narco trafficking. You have severe problems with the corruption of the state. You also have problems in certain areas of Afghanistan with the resurgence of Taliban in southern Afghanistan in certain areas. But against that, I go back to the picture in the lower left-hand corner. When we talk about Afghanistan, we look at snapshots. It's also important to remember the movie called Modern Afghanistan, which we begins in the lower left-hand corner. There is no problem that's out there that's so daunting in this country with the firm support of the international community, NATO, the US, and the Afghans, we should not prevail against this. Now, how do I think that we'll do in 2007? In 2007, Taliban will certainly, in the months ahead, try to surge as they have over the last several years. I actually think we're postured this year in 2007, I think we're postured uh, quite well to deal with this. Why? We have more international security force presence via NATO and a decision by the United States to leave about 3,000 infantry soldiers organized in what we call a combat brigade in Afghanistan. Numbers matter there. Secondly, Afghan national security forces, the army and the police, much stronger in southern and eastern Afghanistan. President Karzai has made some good choices over the last 18 months to improve the quality of governance in the east and the south, where the insurgency is the strongest. And then finally, there's been an increase in the amount of international assistance and aid in the non-military domain, which will be focused in southern and eastern Afghanistan. Again, a decision by the United States government 
made recently to invest about a billion more dollars of aid into the South and into the East. So for a variety of this reason, I think we're reasonably well postured in 2007. The longer term challenge that we have to success would be is when I was testifying in front of the House Armed Services Committee recently, what I termed would be the threat of the irretrievable loss of the legitimacy of the Afghan government in the eyes of its people. We've embarked upon a massive experiment here in Afghanistan and a very daring one in the establishment of a democratic form of government in this country. And so the support that's needed in the area of governance programs, justice programs, economic programs, the extension of social services, those are the areas where the campaign, I believe, could be lost. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, let's shift then to four different areas that I talked about in my introductory remarks here just a moment ago, four different issue areas, as I'd call them, that should perhaps help inform the discussion to, uh, to follow. I'll let you look at those. I'll address those very quickly in order. OK, first, let's talk about the transition from what was the US-led co coalition responsibility for the security of Afghanistan on the international military front to NATO lead. I have shown there what are the sets of missions that the remain with the United States now within the NATO context, first serving as a member of NATO. NATO has about 37,000 forces on the ground in Afghanistan. Of those 37,000, about 16,000 of them are U.S. So our number one mission is serving as part of the NATO force. It's not about NATO or the U.S. The U.S. is the most capable member of NATO. We provide the most capability and the most forces for the mission. But beyond that, we have a set of other missions. We have the responsibility for counterterrorism. We have the responsibility for the building of the Afghan National Army and the support for the building of the police, although here we hope that NATO will take on a much larger role in the years ahead. And then finally, we provide a very capable support for reconstruction and development of Afghanistan, building Afghan National Security Force facilities, helping out with reconstruction and development through our Army Corps of Engineer program that's on the ground. What does NATO bring in to Afghanistan? They bring in a lot more presence of forces. I give the one example, Jim, if you'd point to Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. I give the example of Helmand province in southern Afghanistan, scene of a lot of fighting over the past year. Last year at this time, US military had 150 soldiers in Helmand province. That was the international military force presence. Today, over 3,000 British soldiers, about 3,500 British soldiers <laughs> in that same presence. So they bring more presence. Secondly, they bring a lot more money for reconstruction and development. All the commanders, the military commanders in Afghanistan, will use the expression, one of, my most, one of the best weapon systems I have available to me is reconstruction and development project. Money for roads, money for wells, money for power projects. And NATO, their forces are quickly finding out the same. And so you have a lot of wealthy countries of NATO, more money for reconstruction and development. Thirdly, the image war. It's been fascinating, unintended consequence of NATO's expansion into Afghanistan is in terms of the image war. Up until this point with NATO expansion, the extremist Taliban al-Qaeda propaganda was that you have the US crusading Christian infidel superpower with their Karzai puppet that are despoiling Muslim lands. And I think I've got that pretty well down right now. That was heretofore. At this point now, with the NATO expansion that we have in Afghanistan, that is not a good line for Taliban. It does not ring true and does not uh, ring well. And so in terms of the image war, we've had a significant gain because we have the most capable military alliance in history, 26 countries plus 11 other partner companies, two of those are Muslim nations, that are engaged in the fight in Afghanistan together. Final point about NATO, perhaps you w would like to talk about this during question and answer. I do believe that the military alliance will transform itself militarily in Afghanistan. Uh, unprecedented experience for the alliance. They're, out of Europe, they're outside of Europe for the first time in its history and they're engaged in a very difficult campaign there. Now, what does NATO need to do? NATO needs to provide more capability and forces in accordance with what the political leadership has agreed to. They need to eliminate, nations need to eliminate various constraints that they've placed on their forces. But 
I have confidence when we look at the last three years of experience, now three and a half years of experience of NATO in Afghanistan, which began with a very limited mission of the, under the UN mandate to provide for security for the greater Kabul area as it's expanded in this unprecedented way, I do have confidence that NATO will grow into this mission. Second topic I'd like to talk about, second major issue area is what I talk about shifting to an Afghan lead in every domain. Critical now that we're five plus years into the campaign in Afghanistan that in every area we start to move towards Afghan lead, government justice. What I'll talk about very briefly is with the Afghan National Security Forces. That's been a mission of the U.S. military. We're doing reasonably well with the building of the Army. We began that in a very comprehensive way in 2002. We now have about 37,000 Afghan National Army trained. And our target is, by the end of 2008, to achieve about 70,000. The police <coughs> program, the police program is behind that of the Army. A comprehensive police program did not begin until late 2005. As a result of that, the police program is several years behind that of the Army. On the other hand, the program is a well-resourced program now at this point. There's a massive effort from the United States government, military, Department of State working together closely with support from the international community. And so I'm optimistic over the next several years that we'll get better effects with the police force of Afghanistan as comprehensive reform starts to work its way through the ranks. But this is going to take time. The third area that I'd like to uh, talk about then is the need to shift our emphasis from the military domain to the non-military domain in terms of campaign efforts in Afghanistan. What do I mean by this? What can the military do in Afghanistan? What can the international military forces do? What have we done? We're extraordinarily successful in the early days of the campaign in late 2001 in the counteroffensive against Taliban and al-Qaeda of quickly toppling the extremist Taliban regime. Since then, we've continued to put great pressure on the international terrorist network. We can also, and what we have been able to do, is provide a security shield behind which at every level, metaphorically at the national level, at the provincial level, at the district level. We've been able to provide a security screen. And behind that screen, allowing the Afghan people with time and space, with international community support, to try to rebuild their society, to try to rebuild their middle ground of civil society, to build their state institutions. But increasingly in Afghanistan, there's a need for more resources to be put in the non-military domain. What I've said before, again, with testimony with Congress, is that if you ask me the question today, or when I was the commander in Afghanistan, would you rather have a US infantry battalion of 600 soldiers, or would you prefer to have $100 million for road building? I would say I would take $100 million for road building. If we don't get this right, and we don't reinforce our non-military efforts, the answer three years from now could be that I'll take 600 US infantrymen instead of $100 million per road. And then lastly, the final point I'd like to make is with regard to regional approaches towards the provision of security inside of Afghanistan. If we focus narrowly on Afghanistan in trying to address this problem of terrorism and extremism, if we focus only on Afghanistan, I'm not sure that we can achieve a complete victory. We're up against an international network that does not respect international borders, and they effectively use sanctuary then. They effectively operate on both sides of the border, in this instance, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so, in order to achieve success, we have to be clear that we have to put pressure, steady pressure, on the overall command and control of the extremist forces wherever they are, whether that be in Afghanistan, whether that be in Pakistan. Second point I would make is with regard then to the longer term campaign. Just as I talked about on the Afghan side of the border, that increasingly this has got to be a non-military effort. Change the conditions in that country so that extremism can find no place to root. And so that's the non-military effort. The same applies on the Pakistani side of the border. The same applies throughout the region. Extending governance, eliminating space upon which international terrorism and extremist thought can breed. 
So with that, Ash, I think I'll stop right there. Thank I think you, we're Carl. at about the 20-minute uh, point. Good. And uh, please, sit down here. Please sit down. I'm going to take the first turn and ask General Eikenberry some questions, and then we'll throw the microphones open for your follow-on uh, questions. Well, Carl, I want to start w uh, right away with that last remark you made about <clears throat> we need to deal with them on them being the extremists on the Afghan side of the border and the Pakistani side of the border. And this, if I read the newspaper accounts, this has a sort of deja vu all over again feeling. To we, we got into this in the first place because Al Qaeda was running boot camps in a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Now we learn they're all over on the other side of the border in Pakistan doing the same thing again. So how is this progress? Ash, let me make a, a couple of points. First of all, I, I, I would never want to uh, give the, uh, the impression that when we talk about sources of violence in Afghanistan, root causes of violence in Afghanistan, uh, there are uh, a lot of factors that with inside of Afghanistan itself that are not related at all to Islamic extremism that are sources of violence in Afghanistan. This can be from narco-trafficking, organized criminal elements. You can have areas of southern, even in southern Afghanistan, where you've got tribal fighting that's been going on for hundreds of years, land disputes with the returns of refugees. So I don't want to make this, uh, characterize this as simply a problem of international terrorism that's operating on both sides of the uh, border. There's significant problems within uh, Afghanistan in and of itself. But on the other hand, it's fair to say and characterize that when we talk about the extremist problem, that Taliban's senior leadership has managed to reconstitute itself and I think is more coherent, more organized than it was several years ago. And that the key to success, uh, I said earlier, the key to success here is going to be steady pressure exerted by Afghanistan, Pakistan, against the command and control nodes, right. wherever they are. Let me push you a little on that, because this sounds like sort of squeezing the balloon here, where the, the, uh, the, the threat is now in Pakistan, and you can be building roads and settling age-old tribal grievances all you want in Afghanistan. That isn't why we got into this. We got into this to protect ourselves against extremists who plan against us. And if all that's happening in Pakistan now, what's the pertinence of what's going on in Afghanistan to the threat to us, number one? And number two, what are we going to do about this threat in Pakistan? As you said, we went into Pakistan with two missions. The first was the collapse, the destruction of the extremist Taliban regime and their al-Qaeda allies. The second mission was to help create the conditions so they did not return. Ash, if we walk away from Afghanistan, Afghanistan itself, before we've helped create the conditions of governance in terms of the, uh, the society, unless we've helped create the conditions so that international terrorism cannot return, extremism cannot return, then we'll be back in Afghanistan if we, unless we complete that mission. This enemy will follow us to the United States. Right. Well, how about if you also walk into Pakistan? The, uh, the challenge with uh, Pakistan is a, uh, is a uh, very... Uh, is a very real one. Now, I'd point out with regard to Pakistan. Pakistan, over the last three years, Ash, has had over 400 soldiers that have been killed in combat against the same enemy that's attacking our forces. Over 400 soldiers killed in combat. That's more killed in action against Taliban extremists and international terrorists than we have lost in Afghanistan, including with the NATO forces, the non-US NATO forces. So we are fighting against a, a common enemy. Our military cooperation with Pakistan is extremely good. But Pakistan is faced with a challenge where they have their own ungoverned space, and there remains the need for Pakistan to continue to exert steady pressure against Taliban command and control and extremist command and control. And that's not in your command at the moment. You, you have no, if I understand right, no authority to operate in Pakistan and to um, uh, uh, apply that pressure to the Pakistani government. I'm not saying the United States isn't doing it, but it's not part of the military mission of your command. We have the, uh, we have the authorities that we need to ask to protect our forces uh, wherever they are and wherever the enemy comes from. And we, uh, we exercise that and our commanders exercise that as they uh, need. But in order to get at the problems of the, uh, the more root problems of helping the uh, Pakistanis to extend their governance, 
uh, to come up to adopt a more uh, long-term campaign against the challenges that they face on their side of the border. No, that's something that's outside of the uh, U.S. coalition domain. Let me ask you something else to kind of compare and contrast for us this campaign and the Iraq campaign, about which we read there must be 50 times as much ink dedicated to Iraq than to Afghanistan, and yet it's Afghanistan that was the first thing we did, and the most immediately related thing uh, to 9-11. The public looks like they've almost given up on Iraq, or they think we've lost, or they want to get out, or something. Um, the most, most read book about Iraq is called Fiasco. How do you relate what seems to be happening and, or unraveling or at least discouraging people if it doesn't have to be that way uh, in Iraq from, from what's going on here? I mean, are we winning here, losing here? What's, how do you compare and contrast the two for the ordinary newspaper reader like all of us? I guess the, uh, you know, the, the short characterization of the uh, campaign in Afghanistan is a campaign that uh, we're winning but uh, has yet to be won. Uh, I have not served in Iraq. I, I went to Iraq in uh, early 2004 to uh, conduct an assessment of the Iraqi security forces, but I haven't served in Iraq, so I wouldn't want to do a compare and contrast. What I would do is, is talk about several aspects of the, the Afghanistan campaign that might be helpful as you, as you look at the nature of these conflicts. What are several things that are very much going in our favor in Afghanistan? First of all, I talked about the, the weak institutions of the state of Afghanistan, true enough, but it is a credible central government, still respected by the people. The people at this point in time in 2007 getting more interested in the delivery of goods by this government than how it was elected, but still coherent, respected. Second point about Afghanistan that's important. Uh, Tom Friedman once uh, characterized the, uh, the situation in Iraq, I don't know correctly or incorrectly, but made the observation that perhaps Iraq must go through a, a civil war. I, I don't know. What I do know about Afghanistan is the Afghans have gone through a civil war since the late 1970s. They have an, had an unspeakable civil war, and they are tired of fighting. Still today, 80% of the Afghan people firmly support the presence of international military forces in Afghanistan. So the Afghan people know that they have this moment right now with the international spotlight turned upon them. And there's a consensus, I think, that still exists among their elite. And, all the way down to the level of the common Afghan man, that this is their moment. They've got to seize the moment. And then thirdly, international support and consensus. You have a UN mandate for Afghanistan, and you now have NATO uh, operating within Afghanistan. Some of the challenges that we're facing uh, that might be different here, first of all, I talked at the introduction about the challenges with the topography and the geography formidable. And then secondly, the problems that we have in Afghanistan, I talked about the physical infrastructure and the destruction that occurred to it. Perhaps even more profound is the destruction of the human capital that occurred to Afghanistan during that long period of warfare. We go into Afghanistan, Ash, in uh, the early, in uh, late 2001, part of that baseline, 20% literacy rates, absolutely no trust among the people. So having to go there as a kind of referees and umpires and try to buy time for the Afghans to learn to come back together again as a nation. So some very sharp differences. Some things uh, very much going in our favor, though, in Afghanistan. You, you, you said something real interesting. You had a bullet on there. I wrote it down. Uh, the, the, uh, the need it was the suggestion to shift from the military to the non-military campaign, the military campaign being yours. And then I say, well, that's great. So who does the non-military campaign? For us. Oh, well, it's the Department of Non-Military. We don't have a Department of Non-Military Campaigns. So I sort of observe that your chart is suggesting that the heart of the matter is somewhere where I don't know that we do what you say we need to do. Can you comment a little on that? Who, who do, you, what you do, you do very well. But then I get to the civil side, and I'm at a loss. Ash, there, um, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have uh, answers. Uh, We've got a challenge. We, uh, we still have uh, gaps that are there. In the non-military aspects, um, what do we lack right now? 
uh, in certain functional areas, we lack sufficient expertise deployed to Afghanistan. I'll give you a, a good example. Afghanistan, 80% of the uh, economy is agricultural. We have a huge problem with narco trafficking. Obviously, trying to come up with solutions that address narco trafficking uh, are going to have to get into the agricultural domain. And still today in Afghanistan, we do not have many agricultural uh, experts. So one, problem of qualified people. The second challenge that you have is insufficient resources in certain areas. Uh, we've made a big investment as a government here over the past several months with more money, as I said, a billion more dollars for road building power and for agricultural assistance in southern Afghanistan, but more has to be done. And then the third area is the organizational capacity in order to put these programs together. Your uniform military, uh, by virtue of its experience, uh, is actually fairly capable at taking programs such as the building of a new Afghan army, multi-billion dollar program. Uh, I was comfortable as the uh, commander of the enterprise where we've got about 400 staff officers and non-commissioned officers that are in Kabul managing this program. Several thousand soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines spread out throughout Afghanistan administering the program, training the Afghan army. To come up with similar programs, though, in the area of governance and justice, in some of these functional areas, necessarily the professional development that has taken place in some of the departments which might have to deliver these programs haven't really prepared leaders to think through developing large-scale programs, requesting the resources, and administering them. In this area, I think the, uh, the Kennedy School of Government could be making a uh, contribution in thinking well, about how we're going to be doing I, this in I, the future. I, I would like to think it would, but it, not on the time scale you're talking about. Here, it's just five years after we invaded this place. And you have any glimmer of hope here? I don't see the uh, competence and the level of effort. We have the money. Uh, do people not want to go there? Is, what, what's the, uh, what's the problem? If you're going to wait for our students, they'll do a great job, but they're, they're busy right now and they're not going to graduate for a little while. And uh, you told us that uh, this had to get done. I mean, is it us? Is it NATO? Who's going to do this? And why should I have any hope? Uh, Ash, I think that uh, that's an area that's uh, outside of the uh, military <laughs> domain. There is a, uh, there's a requirement that's uh, there's a requirement that's out there. Our uh, our reservists that have been uh, brought on to active uh, duty and a lot of our uh, uniform military have been performing some of these uh, tasks. But I can uh, as I can simply leave it at uh, more has to be done. I emphasize though this is not just for the United States of America. This is for the international uh, community as well to take this on. Okay, let me, let me make you uncomfortable in a different way then, and then I'll stop. You're going to go off to NATO now. Carl's next uh, assignment is, is in Brussels, and that's a wonderful thing to have someone uh, as experienced and wise in, as he is in NATO. However, he said, and again, I wrote this down, that he has confidence that NATO will grow into this mission. And I say to myself, uh, the defense spending of the most NATO nations, ourselves an exception, are going down. Uh, the Germans are, believe it or not, debating whether to fly their tornado aircraft in a reconnaissance mode, completely harmless uh, thing, as though it were uh, Operation Barbarossa to invade the Soviet Union or something portentous. Um, and so, what do you expect? So, and we've handed this over, this hot potato over to NATO. And I'm being a little cynical here, but the question is why? Give me some reason for your confidence. What are the signs that make you think that NATO will grow into the role? Or maybe it's just some NATO nations. Well, I could probably start by asking anyone to, in this uh, audience uh, to raise their hand if six years ago posed with the question, will NATO? be outside of Europe, inside of Afghanistan, conducting counterinsurgency operations as a military alliance. And six years ago, who would have raised their hand and said yes? You couldn't have foreseen this. And so you look at the adaption that NATO has made. As I said, they began with a narrow mandate for the responsibility for the security of the greater Kabul area. They expanded a year later in 2004. They expanded into northern Afghanistan. 
a year later into western Afghanistan, in 2006 into southern and eastern Afghanistan, where they're now fighting a counterinsurgency. At each point, NATO has faced extraordinary challenges with that advance, but at each point they've also continued to adapt. There are some significant uh, challenges that NATO is facing right now, but I also believe that 10 years from now, if NATO maintains the political will to remain in Afghanistan, I'm very confident that 10 years from now, as people back, look back on the alliance, they will say that the experience of Afghanistan with military forces deployed and the military experience that they gained there and the political military experiences that they gained there will transform this alliance. The final point I'd make about NATO is that there is too much in this world to be done by the United States military alone in terms of the provision of security. We need NATO with us, and I believe that the Afghanistan mission is a great mission for the alliance. Terrific. Well, thank you. I'm now going to open up the floor to questions, and what I'd ask you to do is to um, approach the microphone, identify yourself, please, uh, ask your question, uh, make it a real question, not I know you won't do this, Luke, but uh, not a speech, uh, and try to be as brief as possible because we want to get as many questions in as, as we can. Sir. Thank you, sir, for coming out here tonight. My name is Luke Hardig, and I'm a second year master's student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I enjoyed your, your responses to Dr. Carter's questions about uh, improving civilian capacity for post-conflict stability operations. My question for you is more about the command of them. and. I was wondering what you thought, first of all, about the separate chains of command for civilian versus deployed military personnel, and how you think that we can better manage civil-military relations for post-conflict operations uh, so that we ensure unity of command and unity of effort. Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's one that we, we've talked about in Afghanistan to uh, an extraordinary degree. You know, you have, you've got the, the operational level command, the overall command in Afghanistan, and then you work your way down towards the more grassroots level. One of the, one of the important innovations that we began early in Afghanistan was something that we called the provincial reconstruction teams. Provincial reconstruction teams, provinces of Afghanistan, there's 34 of them. It's the uh, level of governance below the national level. We established provincial reconstruction teams in a lot of the provinces, especially eastern and southern Afghanistan. These were combined civil military teams projected out from Kabul to help provide security, very importantly, to help the Afghan government, which we knew after these decades of warfare would be slow to stand up at the national level, and to help President Karzai and his administration stretch their influence out into the provinces, combined civil military teams. The model of that has been with military lead. But there's been an important innovation in one of the provinces of Afghanistan, northeast of uh, Kabul City and Panjir province, relatively tranquil province. That is actually under Department of State lead, and he's in the command of the military component that's under him as well, or the overall director of it. So there's been some experimentation that's gone on. Uh, is it possible that in the early days of the uh, campaign that there could have been a more unified effort with civilian in support of the military and then a transition to the reverse of that. I don't know, that's for, uh, I guess that's for people to look back on later. But my own belief is that whatever the form of achieving unity of effort, sometimes things get so complicated out in the field, so to speak, that the only way to achieve unity of effort is through unity of command. And the thumbnail sketch is the tougher the security environment probably the more the command should go to the military commander. And then as you begin that transition, as you get the security situation improved, the transition should then go to civilian leadership with the military in support. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I wish you could speak about the uh, uh, spike in suicide terrorism in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a lot of vague references in the media to the Iraqification or the importing of Iraqi tactics. Have you seen any evidence or anything tangible linking this destructive phenomena in Iraq to what's going on in Afghanistan. And also, do you have any idea on the makeup of these suicide bombers? You know, we have these vague references again. And how are you adopting to this destructive tactic and this phenomena? Yeah, it's a, uh, of course, it's extraordinarily difficult to defend against suicide bombers and to those that 
their tactics are uh, where there's uh, no uh, consideration of their own loss of life, and uh, they're not going to distinguish between what we would characterize as a legitimate military uh, target and just indiscriminate slaughter against uh, civilians. So a tough target to uh, defend against. In terms of how we are defending against that, uh, it's not only our military efforts, but the front line of that has got to be with the Afghans themselves, with the development of their own intelligence networks and the police. That's why, the, of many reasons, that this police program is urgent that we move forward with it. Uh, to talk about the transfer of tactics and techniques from Iraq to uh, Afghanistan, uh, we keep an eye on this. We have not seen commanders coming from Iraq, jihadi commanders coming from Iraq and moving into Afghanistan. We watch that very carefully. Some anecdotal evidence, but no clear trend. On the other hand, clearly over the last several years, the enemy has reverted to an increase in terms of suicide attacks, terrorist kind of classic terrorist attacks against the, uh, the Afghan people and our forces. Uh, that probably says more about the weakness of the enemy militarily. Wherever the enemy does tend to mass, wherever we find them in the Afghan National Army and police find them, uh, generally they don't last very long in the field, and so they're reluctant to mass. So it remains uh, very much a, a war of perceptions and a war to uh, try to intimidate the Afghan people, efforts to discredit the government of Afghanistan, show weakness, efforts to try to erode the will of NATO and hope politically that they can force the withdrawal of international military forces. But I say that it is important when we talk about these uh, kind of attacks, uh, it is important that we do occasionally reflect on what does it say about the nature of the enemy, what does it say of the nature of the threat. Last year, what did uh, Taliban extremists shift to as one of their main targets? Schools. Killing school teachers in front of their uh, students sending night letters out, night letters they put in villages to warn villagers that your children are at risk if you attend school. Now, what do we treasure the most as a resource, as an asset? We treasure our children. Think about the tactics that the enemy is using. What does the enemy fear? They literally fear an opening the mind. And that's why a strategic target for them is education. They don't blow bridges up because they know that that can turn the tide against them but they have enough confidence in certain areas to methodically go after schools and education. We've changed that on the coalition side. I know NATO has made that now one of our strategic indicators of success and a very high value target for us to defend schools. My name is uh, Andre Stein. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. My question is, what are the key lessons that have been learned from the security sector reform process in Afghanistan given that the international community is now engaging in SSR processes elsewhere in multi-ethnic societies which have emerged from war like Iraq and Kosovo? Yeah, that's a great question. If I could, just for the audience, when we talk about in Afghanistan, when we talk about security re as, uh, sector reform, actually had five pillars that were prescribed by the Geneva Accord in 2002 with the G8 where five sectors is what we would call security sector reform. The army, the US took the lead. The police, the Germans took the lead. Justice, the Italians took the lead. Counter narcotics, the British took the lead. And then finally, in what we call demobilization, disarmament of the, of the militia, the Japanese took the lead. Now, lessons in uh, security uh, sector reform, several. First of all, in terms of building of security institutions, now talking about the police and the army, uh, go back to the baseline of Afghanistan and go back to building of security institutions. What are the attributes of security institutions if they're going to work in a place like Afghanistan? They have to be national, they have to be all ethnic, and they have to be a disciplined force. They have to be a force that's well-led. They have to be a force that respects the rule of law and respects the national flag. How long does it take to develop something like this? How long does it take to develop those attributes? And I use the example here of Major Jim Tenpenny, my uh, aide that's uh, here with me today. Jim, at one point in time here over the next several years, he'll be uh, promoted to lieutenant colonel, and then he'll command a battalion of about 20 Black Hawk helicopters. Before Jim is entrusted by the United States Army, to command that battalion of Black Hawk helicopters, 
he will have had about 18 years of military service and several years of pre-commissioning service before he was entrusted to do that. Now, we don't have in <laughs> Afghanistan 20 plus years to develop Afghan battalion commanders. Neither is it realistic, though, for us to expect that we can develop leaders that have the necessary attributes to lead a disciplined force that respects the rule of law. Is it realistic for us to expect we can do this cheaply and quickly? The second point, and the, the only other point I'd make on security sector reform, is uh, thinking through the complexities of it and the interrelationships. Uh, one of the great ones that I'll talk about in uh, security sector reform, one of the uh, uh, most evident cases, is in the area of justice. Well, we talk about the building of police in Afghanistan. Does provision of police equal justice? And the answer, of course not. It's necessary but insufficient condition. We talk about the three C's that bring about a total justice system, and that's cops, that's courts, and that's correctional institutes. And so there's a tendency on all of our parts, the international side and indeed the Afghans, to concentrate simply on security forces. Emphasis on building armies, a little bit behind that, the police. But indeed, all of the strands of what you're talking about require sufficient resources and the ability to try to thread these together in ways that are extraordinarily complex. Good evening, General. My name is Dipali Mukhopadhyay. I'm a PhD student at the Fletcher School. And my question is um, based on what some people have written, which is to say that um, reconstruction of Afghanistan, state building, and the counterterrorism mission are competing agendas, if not conflicting agendas. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about how the US military has tried to balance um, its counterterrorism agenda with its hope to win the peace and create um, security and confidence among the Afghan people. That, that's why the international community is there. Can you say a there. little bit more for those who don't quite get it? What, what's, the con what's the nature sure, of the Sure. I, I think that you can make the argument that um, the counterterrorism mission is one that's focused on what's best for the United States and its allies. And it requires certain campaigns and activities that are potentially competing with peace building, state building projects and aims. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that balance. Yeah, it's a great question, of course. What takes us to Afghanistan, you know, back to September 11, 2001. So the uh, urgent mission is put together an expeditionary force, get it halfway around the world, and go on the offensive against uh, al-Qaeda and their extremist Taliban allies. But not long after we execute that mission, begin that mission, the mission then transitions and we get an additional mission. And that mission is simply put again, helping to create the conditions in Afghanistan so they do not uh, return. And what I'd say is that you know, we, we continue to adapt as a uh, military organization. We continue to adapt as a United States government effort in Afghanistan. And I think that your armed forces in Afghanistan, our armed forces in Afghanistan, uh, they're a highly adaptable uh, group of people because we reflect American society. And one of the mer merits of American society, one of our great attributes as a people, is our creativity and adaptability. So if you look at the total effort right now of all of our forces that we have in Afghanistan, on any given day, actually a small part of that effort is aimed at the counter-terrorist mission. The counter-terrorist mission here defined as the destruction of al-Qaeda and their senior Taliban and Afghan allies. A large part of the mission right now, most of the resources are building Afghan national security forces, provincial reconstruction teams, helping in the civil military domain. And I think that we're doing that uh, reasonably well. Uh, if I would give an example of you know, how we conceive right now of our effort. How does our military conceive of our effort? Uh, I can give the example of when I talk about the non-military uh, domain and uh, how we see its relationship to security. I've used the expression before that, and all of our military <coughs> commanders in Afghanistan are comfortable with the expression, where the roads end, that's where the Taliban begins. If I can give you one quick vignette that tells, I think is powerful in terms of how your military conceives of the uh, campaign. 
We had a road in southeastern uh, Afghanistan. We had two villages in uh, southeastern Afghanistan, a province called Paktia. Jim, if you could uh, flash that up there. And in southeastern Afghanistan, close to the Pakistani border, two towns, Organi and Sharana. And I'm sure no one here has ever heard of Organi or Sharana before. Two towns that were about 60 miles apart. There was no road that connected them. They co the Afghans called it a road. If it was a road, I've never seen anything like it. It took us about 12 hours to get that 60 miles. We then committed a group of US military engineers with a lot of Afghan assistance, hired a lot of Afghans, used Afghan construction companies. We improved that road. We didn't put pavement in there. It's not an interstate. It's a hard packed dirt road. Travel time now has gone from 12 hours to two hours. I traveled that road last year with the governor of the province. We stopped along the route. And we stopped at a gas station along the route. And the gas station, believe it or not, had been there when it wasn't a road at all. And I asked the gas station owner, well, how's business right now? And he said, business is booming. And I asked him the question, why? And his eyes got very large. And he said, turn around, look at the road that you guys built. That's why. But then I asked him the next important, the more important question, how is security, if you want, from a military perspective? How is security? And he said, security is superb along the road. I asked him why. Once again, he was incredulous. Look at the road. He said, once that road was built, this is the Afghan gas station owner saying, once the road was built, then along that road, a school was built. And because there's a road connecting now all the villages, the villagers can get their children to school, a universal aspiration for families. What else was, were they able to do? There was a health clinic built. And now when a woman goes into labor, she's got a pretty good chance to get to the clinic before delivery, a universal aspiration for the Afghan people, for everyone. What else? Bazaars have been built along that road. They've reached a point now where, to go back to this expression about the middle ground of civil society, has been built along that little narrow stretch of Afghanistan. And what the gas station owner told me now is when strangers come into the villages, the villagers tell them to leave. And if they don't leave, they call the police. They'll call the coalition forces. So that's our military concept of the campaign. It is about security, but it's about providing the shield. Give space, time, and let the Afghans build their civil society behind that. Once they have civil society upon which to stand, they'll hold their middle ground. And there'll be no room for international extremists on that middle ground. Hi, my name is Bill Rubin. I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School. And I was wondering, is the Karzai government pursuing any sort of political solution that might involve bringing um, certain elements of the Taliban into the government? And do you think that that might be a way to reduce the need for the counterinsurgency campaign? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. In fact, over the last several years, uh, the Afghans have two years. The Afghans have had a formal governmental program to try to reach out to the Taliban. It's called Program to Kimi Sole, which is Reconciliation Program. It's a program in which the extremist former Taliban leaders, foot soldiers, can come in from the cold program of negotiation with them. They have to sign a statement to abide by certain rules. The higher level commanders, pretty flexible program. The higher level commanders, if they come in, there'll be a monitoring uh, over uh, time for those uh, leaders, and then eventually they can get their rights back. The program has had mixed results. Uh, pretty successful in getting foot soldiers and lower level commanders. They have not had success with senior level commanders at this point. Uh, Afghan politics are uh, complex enough that I really wouldn't want to uh, second guess or comment or conjecture as to what would be the right time for President Karzai and his administration to negotiate. They have an op a very open door right now. My sense is that uh, in many quarters right now that the Taliban leadership is tired of fighting. There, we do see certain divisions within their ranks. And I believe that the Afghan uh, body politic, that they have enough wisdom among themselves that as conditions continue to evolve, they'll find a way to uh, continue a dialogue to try to bring in as many as they can. There's a set of leaders, on the other hand, who are out there on the Taliban side that uh, they've committed uh, unspeakable atrocities against their own people. And I doubt that in certain instances, 
whether uh, even the Afghan uh, leadership, whether the Afghan leadership would uh, brook negotiations with them. Sir, uh, for years, Afghanistan has been known as a tribal society. Uh, could you comment a little uh, about the relationship between the various tribes, Pashtuns, Tajiks, and the Taliban? I mean, are some closer than the others, or who harbors what? Yeah, uh, also an important uh, question. Clearly, the, um, the, the Pashtun tribal, uh, uh, the, the large Pashtun population, the Pashtun heartland, is in eastern Afghanistan and southern Afghanistan. Indeed, within southern Afghanistan, Jim, if you'd focus on uh, Kandahar up there, indeed, Kandahar really representing the more political, cultural center of the uh, Pashtun uh, people. The Taliban never had strong resonance within the non-Pashtun groups. Uh, on the other hand, the door opened for Taliban to advance in the uh, mid-1990s because of the depredations that many of the Mujahideen warlord leaders had inflicted on the Afghan people during the Civil War period of time. So what the Taliban offered was a very brutish kind of uh, security that they did impose. Uh, if there's resonance within Taliban uh, ideology still within Afghanistan. It's within selected parts of the deep Pashtun tribal belt. But I talked about polling that's taken place, talked about the acceptance of the Afghan people for the international military forces. Another interesting poll, consistent results since 2002, is broadly what do the Afghan people think about a return of the Taliban? 90% consistently from 2002 reject a return to Taliban. Those areas where it's more popular, again, certain areas of southern Afghanistan, southeastern, and uh, eastern Afghanistan. People talk also about the Pashtun tribal nation. However, remember when we talk about Taliban, there's very little resonance with Taliban within the traditional Pashtun tribal network. Taliban represents an extraordinary anomaly in longer Afghan history, and that is it's an extremist, militant, idea, uh, fundamentalist ideology. And over the course of the 1980s and the 1990s, during the anti-Soviet jihad in the 1980s, and then during the Civil War during the 1990s, systematically, extremist Islamic leaders, some backed by us in the 1980s, and then later under uh, Taliban in the 1990s, systematically, eroded and destroyed the traditional tribal leader network of the uh, Pashtuns and those places that they were operating in. Good evening, sir. Um, my name is Jenny Zhang, and I'm a freshman at the college. Um, can you talk a little more specifically about some of the specific challenges and successes faced in establishing the national security force and also um, about what role they'll be expected to play in the coming years? And I'm going to take this question also as the last question. I'm sorry for those of you who have been waiting. Hey, why don't we, you get, both ask your questions and then Carl can answer them both. I'm just mindful of the clock. Okay. Um, my name is Takeuchi. I'm a second-year graduate student in East Asian Studies program. I think, like today, to minimize the impact of the military operation to the civil life or like local people's life is really important, I guess. And could I ask you, the U.S. Army's effort, like, what do you consider when? you establish them one certain military operation to minimize the impact to the local people's life or? Yeah, uh, two, uh, two good questions. First of all, with regard to the, uh, the successes in building uh, Afghan national security forces, we, uh, with regard to the Army, which we've been after uh, the, the longer period of time, we've had some pretty good successors. We've had reverses as well. It's just extraordinarily slow going. Uh, tough work after uh, the chaos that uh, we inherited from this uh, 30 years of uh, warfare. But the success we have had is with regard to the Army, we've done a pretty good job of making it an all-national institution. Indeed, when you talk about Afghanistan and the, uh, and the Afghan National Army, I believe that the Afghan National Army really represents a strategic asset for the Afghan people. Maybe not so important right now, today in 2007, how does the Afghan National Army do 
uh, in its fight against Taliban. The more important question is how respected are they as a national institution? And they're extraordinarily well respected because they're all national. So there's problems within the Afghan National Army. Sure, they have, they have their own problems with corruption. They have their own problems with leadership. But consistently, the Afghan people receive the Afghan National Army well. Why do I call it a strategic asset? Because in Afghanistan, the challenge we have is after this extended warfare, trying to bring these people back together again and give them confidence with our presence that they can work together again, all ethnic groups. They can work together again as a nation. The Afghan National Army, that green beret that they wear, it's a national institution. It's living proof to the Afghan people and reassurance that they can come back together. So we've taken a values-based approach. We've taken an all-national approach. As a result, we've had to go slow, but I think it's in the right path forward. I'm extraordinarily proud of the performance of the Afghan National Army. Once I talked to a field commander on the uh, eastern uh, Afghanistan border with Pakistan, I asked him, can you use more uh, US infantry here? And he said, no, sir, we got it. And I walked away, and uh, he said, but General, there is one thing. I can use more Afghan National Army here. Mm -hmm. So they're, uh, they're coming along. I've already talked about the police. With regard to um, this challenge of how do we conduct military operations to uh, reduce uh, civilian uh, casualties, I'll tell you, we go through extraordinary, we take extraordinary steps to uh, try to do everything we can to minimize the loss of civilian life. I even, we have a system that's set up with commanders at various levels depending upon the complexity of the operation, the risk of the operation, that we will have commanders that make decisions at various levels consistent for emergencies work where, of course, our forces have the necessary authorities on the ground to protect themselves as needed. But at my level of command, I've made decisions where we would not move forward with an operation because I determined that the risk was uh, too great. Now, what's the key here? What's the key? It gets back to Afghan national security forces. The Afghan people, they aspire to exercise their own sovereignty as fast as they can. And what is the most manifest, visible symbol of sovereignty, monopoly of your government on the use of force, credible security forces. So we need to move forward with building the Afghan army and the Afghan police with them in the lead. Very frankly, for very understandable reasons, the Afghan army and the Afghan police can conduct an operation in which there is civilian loss of uh, life or civilians who are wounded and the Afghan people have much more acceptance and tolerance of that, and that's very understandable. Carl, you have the last word here this evening before we thank you for being here. Is there anything you want to share with us? Uh, Ash, thanks. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do, I, uh, I try when, uh, and, and thanks for uh, coming tonight and showing the interest in, uh, in Afghanistan and, your, and in your armed forces. I'd like to give uh, just one uh, vignette whenever I'm with a, a group that uh, tries to describe the uh, quality of the members of your armed forces that are serving in Afghanistan for the, uh, for the Americans that are here today. And I'll give the story tonight of a Captain Ken Dwyer. Captain Ken Dwyer, Special Forces. Uh, Captain Ken Dwyer, 27 years old, infantry captain, married Columbia, South Carolina is his home. Ken served three tours of duty in Afghanistan. On his first tour of duty, he was a uh, infantry officer, second and third tours of duty, special forces. His second tour of duty served along the Afghan-Pakistan frontier and did great work serving out in a fire base. He came back for a third tour of duty. That third tour of duty was cut short in August of 2006. It was cut short when Captain Ken Dwyer was caught in a Taliban ambush in Urzgan province in southern Afghanistan, north of uh, Tarankaut. Cam Ken Dwyer, when he was caught in this ambush, he was riding in an up-armored Humvee, a rocket propelled grenade, went through the up-armored Humvee. The last thing Ken remembers is trying to reach down in pain and pass a box of ammunition up to the gunner, and he passed out in pain. Ken was then evacuated to Germany. He was then evacuated to the United States of America. I had the uh, honor of uh, seeing Ken then as he was recovering. And in the hospital, I walked up to uh, Ken. Ken was on a treadmill, and he was wearing an uh, Army uh, PT uniform. But he had changed because he had lost his uh, arm from the elbow down, and he had lost his uh, eyesight in his uh, left eye, and that will never come back. 
Ken got off the treadmill, he saluted to me, and uh, asked me if uh, I could help him with a couple questions he had. And he had three questions. The first question was, how's his special forces team doing north of Terran Kaut? And I had checked on, him, on that force before I saw him in the hospital and said they're doing pretty good. The second question Ken had got at this question about how do you help build the uh, middle ground of uh, Afghan uh, society? Well, how does our military see the mission? Ken's second question was, how are those Afghans doing in the village that we're fighting around? Are we keeping the Taliban away from them? How are we doing with the building of the school? How's that road coming in? And I told Ken we're doing pretty well. The third question was the most profound, most humbling. And the third question he asked me is, General, can I get back to the Special Forces School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and be a teacher? Because you see, I've lost my arm, I've lost my eyesight. I can't be a Special Forces operator inside of Afghanistan. But I've learned a lot in three tours of duty in Afghanistan. And I've got a lot I can still help teach our forces. There's a lot I know, and I want to help communicate that. And I want to stay in this fight. Can you help me get assigned to the Special Forces School? That was Ken Dwyer's request. So what I tell you is that in Afghanistan, that we will prevail in Afghanistan if we maintain the time, the patience, and the commitment that we need to prevail. And we're going to prevail in a place like Afghanistan, at least in the military domain, not because of Carl Eikenberry, but because guys like Captain Ken Dwyer. So Ash, I wanted to uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to talk here tonight. Well, Ken, uh, let me uh, uh, first of all thank our audience for being here tonight, uh, Jim, for, for introducing you, but uh, Carl, really to you for uh, everything you've done. You've been a good friend uh, to me for a long time, but most importantly, everything you've done for now for Afghanistan on behalf of not just the Americans in here, but there are a lot of others involved, and I guess everybody shares in the destiny of this place. So thank you for being with us tonight, and thanks for everything you've done. Thank you, Ash. Thanks. Thank you all.